and uh, get started. Other people will trickle in, but time. So, um, welcome to the afternoon. If everybody's having a good work yet, um, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, debugging, troubleshooting in WordPress. Um, there will be for this talk. I kind of have uh, some introductory type stuff um, for sort of newer developers, and then we'll get a little bit more into some more advanced tools. Um, and just some general concepts about troubleshooting. Uh, and then towards the end, I'll kind of do some demos. So we'll see how live demos go, and then if you have questions, we'll just go from there. Uh, my name is William Bernhardt. I work for Bluehost, uh, primarily as a WordPress support contributor. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at EarnJam, uh, my website at EarnJam.com. I'll usually put the slides up there afterwards. Um, EarnJam is also my WordPress.org username. So. And should contribute in the core, let me know. We can always use the help. Um, so, before we like dive straight into just tools and things, uh, I want to talk a little bit about troubleshooting and general strategies. Um, there's a few things to consider before you even start. Stuff like, is now the right time to even fix this or solve this? How priority is this issue? Um, or even like, should I fix this at all? You know, perhaps it's a bug and it appears in like specific circumstances that are really rare. You kind of have to weigh the priorities of your business versus the cost of troubleshooting and debugging. Because it does take time. Um, and that might be better spent on like features or enhancements or even different bugs. So every time you, you come across something, you kind of have to evaluate that. And I say this because like I have a tendency to just jump right in and try and solve the problem when I find it. I just like enjoy problem solving. Um, but it's okay to like pass on debugging something. But if you decide it's important enough, um, then the next step is kind of to make sure that you gather enough information that you're not wasting your time so you're spinning your wheels trying to trouble something, troubleshoot something. Um, having a good foundation of information is critical to being able to troubleshoot quickly and effectively. Um, possibly the biggest portion of troubleshooting in general is that information gathering stage rather than like evaluating logic. It's that gathering of trying to um, build this foundation information that helps you solve the problem. Almost all bugs are reported by someone. Now that might be like a visitor to your site experiencing issues. It could be an admin of a site that you build or manage or maybe someone who's using a plugin that you've built. Uh, but it could also be you, the developer. You might identify some functionality that isn't working, as intended, or you might notice some like unexpected output in the logs or something like that. Uh, when anyone identifies a bug, the most important part of the reporting is ensuring that you have enough information. The more you have, the easier it is the quicker you can solve it. So with bug reports, I like to think that there's sort of three fundamental pillars. You need to know what happened, the specific details about what occurred, what did you expect to happen, and what did you do that led to that action. If you don't have one of those things, it makes it much harder to really nail, nail down what the problem is. So when you get a bug report from someone, you should try and make sure that all those questions are answered before you can move forward. Um, and if, if one of those are out, you can just kind of reach out, follow up, and try to get a little bit more details. Now when these bug reports do, come from someone else, um, it's common for them to be short on the required information. Like I said, it might be missing one of those sort of three pillars, but it also might be sort of limited in one of those areas. Um, and there's a number of different ways that this can manifest. Uh, I find that there are several that are more common than others. Um, and so you may want to like identify these patterns uh, and ask the right questions to kind of fill those gaps. Uh, the first and probably most common is unspecified nouns. You know, how often have you gotten someone just saying, like, your website's broken, your links don't work? Um, but you can counter those by sort of asking, like, what specifically? What specifically about the website is? Which links don't work? Um, similar to that is unspecified verbs. You know, he put an image on the page, she installed the plugin, but we don't know how that happened. You can say that that occurred, but we don't have any details about the process that happened there. There's a lot of ways to do this thing, so if we don't know the method that was taken, it's hard to then troubleshoot that particular method. 
Comparisons can be pretty useful if they provide specific information, but often they're overly general, and the thing that's being compared to is left out. Like, this website is slow, this form is hard to use, but you know, slow compared to what? Another website? Compared to the same website yesterday? Uh, it's hard to use compared to what? Another form? Or a pen and paper? Um, the danger with comparisons beyond that is that it might just be someone's opinion and not actually be some sort of factual information that's going to help you solve the problem. These opinions during that gathering phase are dangerous because they lead to assumptions. And a common type of assumption you may come across is this modal operators of impossibility. You know, I can't get to the page, I can't do this. Um, and that's, a, that's something where you have to dig in and sort of ask, like, why can't you do this? What is preventing you from getting to it? What is preventing you from completing the purpose? Uh, what is it that makes this task impossible? So we kind of see universal quantifiers. We also think about those as kind of um, always true. It's, um, they're never, you should basically shouldn't use those because in most cases it's never going to be true. Um, and then complex equivalents. You have this situation where assumptions may connect to two things that have incomplete data. So, but as it's commonly said, correlation does not equal causation. So that's a dangerous thing to, to connect there. So obviously these are you know, these are kind of generic, and um, it's not specific to debugging or specific to WordPress. These apply to anything. But I think it's important to kind of recognize these because it helps you become a better troubleshooter and a better debugger when you can identify that these. Uh, these are, these are happening and, and get to the root of them. So when you have that information, then it's, you can take that and apply some sort of standard methods, standard strategies. And then you can make like a checklist of these things, but they don't necessarily apply to all situations. And a lot of these will seem really obvious, um, but I still think it's helpful to read them and see them. And then think about those and how the tools that we're about to cover can use these methods um, to help help you figure out what's going on. So let's go through the strategies and then we'll talk about how they come into play with WordPress. So the first thing is duplication. Now this might be considered part of like information gathering. Um, it's essentially just like recreating the issue. Uh, it could be considered you know, part of that information gathering phase, but it's something that like you'll return to repeatedly. Um, if you can you can consistently recreate the problem, then you'll know when you fixed it because you know the steps that led to it happening and you know that doing those steps again now is not causing that problem. So it's important to do this one early on in the process so you can sort of fill that third section of the report and what did you do. Uh, keeping a log, this one's kind of optional, but um, I find it helpful for really complex <coughs> things. And you know, it's basically keeping a record of the things that you tried. Um, because as you're doing them, stuff like the order that you did them might matter. So if you, if you recognize as you've written out the log that, um, oh, I, I did A before B this time, but actually you know, I reverse that order, it fixes the problem. Uh, but it's also helpful to make sure you're not trying the same things over and over again when you've been banging your head against the problem for a long time. If I obviously only make one change at a time, don't change two things and then don't know which one actually fixed the problem. Of course, the classic, like, is it plugged in? Um, <laughs> is the plugin even active? Are you even on the right web server? Um, are you sure you're not looking at your local site and not the, the, the production site? Um, is your hosting provider having issues? Could be all sorts of things. Um, just kind of that basic. Are you sure it's actually on? Uh, and then bare bones, this is something that we um, we preach to this on the support side for which WordPress.org is whenever someone um, reports a bug to core, the first thing we always ask is, is this still happening with no plugins active and on the default theme? Because if those, if that sort of bare bones setup is there and a bug is still occurring, then you know that it's WordPress. Um, so this is. The idea here is basically remove it down to the most basic state that you can possibly have it in and still do this task that you're trying to do and see if the bugs still occur. Uh, it seems pretty obvious, but it's 
you know, good to be reminded of that. That's also kind of a, a similar strategy to this one, which is shortening the chain. So bare bones is shortening that chain to nothing. But shortening the chain could be anywhere of like cutting it in half. I mean, think about like, if I were to ask you, uh, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 10, and I want you to guess the number. But you can ask me questions one way. The most efficient way to find that number is going to say, you're going to pick the middle. And say, is it 5? And I'll say, no, it's higher. So then you shorten that chain down. Now you only have five to choose from rather than ten. Um, so in WordPress, the chain is from uh, the start is when you first make your request, the sort of action taken, till when the page finishes loading, when the request finishes and the response is returned to you. Um, any portion of that process that you can rule out is helpful. So if you can load like one page on the site but not another one, even that is helpful because then you know well your internet's working, uh, the web servers of uh, parts in the site are working. I narrowed it down to the, the problem is just on this one area. So you shorten the chain. Um, this method can be applied to reach that bare bones state I just covered where you just keep stepping down until you get to that point. Or you can go the other direction. Where you go to the bare bones, step your way back up to see where that problem is introduced. So we got these sort of strategies and now let's talk about the tools because that's kind of the fun part anyway. Um, first, I want to go through a couple of plugins that I love and use uh, pretty frequently. Um, and I think they're, they're pretty helpful to give you sort of insight into what your code is doing. Um, the first is just, this is kind of a must help for everybody for troubleshooting. It's the official WordPress.org uh, health check plugin. Um, some of this functionality has been merged into Core now in 5.2 in the site health tool. Uh, but it does still have um, a troubleshooting mode where you can have it deactivate all uh, plugins and switch to a default theme for just your user. So that's something that's helpful to use on a production site where you don't want to switch off of your theme and have your visitors not see your, your design and all that. You don't want to turn off the plugin for your visitors, it might be critical, but you want to be able to check something and make sure something's happening. It allows you to kind of turn them on back on one at a time. And again, it's just for your login user, so the other users, visitors to your site aren't going to see that. Another plugin that's really helpful is uh, user switching. This one is uh, it's, it's really helpful when you're building things that have different capabilities for different users or different roles on the site to allow you to test those roles out. So if you're an administrator, you may not be seeing the same problems that an editor might see or an author might see. And this will allow you to switch directly to a specific user. So if I know a user has reported a problem, I can switch into their account and try and recreate the issue using their role, their specific account. And then you might be able to sell, okay, well this user doesn't have the right capabilities, I can actually fix that. Um, it allows you to kind of switch back and forth. There's no login sharing. Um, it's also multi-site compatible, which is pretty important with multi-site where you have super admins that are admins across a number of sites and then individual site admins and then editors all down the line. So pretty helpful. WP Crontrol is a way, is a plugin for uh, managing and kind of getting some insight into WordPress Cron. Uh, WordPress Cron is kind of a black hole. It just sort of, it's hard to sort of discover what's going on. It's execution, those cron tasks are triggered by a request, but they're spun off into their own request. So it can be hard to kind of make sure that they're firing or to make sure that they're actually running. Um, this gives you some good insight into that. It allows you to click, click and make it run directly, uh, sort of manually on demand, or you can add or remove them directly from there. Um, I'll give you a little demo of this one in a minute. And then finally, the, my favorite that I just always turn on and use pretty constantly is Query Monitor. Um, it's really helpful for getting some insight into database queries, how long they're taking, what specific queries are run, but it goes way beyond that. Um, it'll tell you all the hooks that are being used, uh, gives you a lot of information about the specific request and what page templates are being loaded and 
there's just so many features that it's, I can't really list them all out. Um, I'll give a quick demo of that one in just a second as well. Uh, but it's, it's really powerful. So those plugins can provide you with more information to help you troubleshoot. Uh, but it's helpful to have more insight into the state of what's happening in your code while it executes. Um, so beyond just sort of these WordPress plugins, let's go over a couple of common methods for like digging deeper into what's actually happening in your code. The first is just sort of logging, just standard, standard logging. Um, a lot of people sort of take it granted that this occurs, but it can be helpful for finding these issues. Um, it's usually the first method people begin to use to get inside when you're developing. You think about when you first started uh, doing your Hello World application, right? You echo Hello World to the screen. So you've just written out to some destination. The most basic form of logging is simply outputting to the screen. So that might be using Echo, it might be using if you're doing PHP, it might be Echo, it might be uh, Bear Dump, it might be Printit Bar, uh, some real basic things, but they're they're helpful just to kind of write stuff to, to give you an insight of what's happening. But there's also sort of logs that are automatically available to you that you can look at to kind of get get more information. Uh, if you're using Apache or Nginx, they'll have error logs and access logs. So if there's errors occurring, they're right there. Access logs will show you every request that came into your server, so you can kind of time those appropriately, see what gets them inside onto maybe a browser, um, other things like that. The PHP error logs are helpful, and then the browser console, obviously, for JavaScript errors. Um, the logging differs from debugging slightly, so that's the next thing I want to talk about is debugging. The logging differs from debugging where um, Logging gives you insight throughout the lifetime, the life cycle of a request. And then debugging is more pausing a request at a specific moment and seeing the state of your application in that moment. <coughs> Debuggers basically allow you, as I said, allow you these, these breakpoints. Pause, pause your executing code, inspect the variables that are in place. Um, for PHP, this would be using something like xDebug. For JavaScript, you can use the browser debugger, um, the console, and then um, both of those can integrate directly into your, into your IDE, into your editor, so that you can jump right back and forth between them um, and see specific points in the code. So, on those notes, let's do some demos. So. Okay, so I've set up this little simple site. Why isn't this working? Debug in that test. Uh, I put a ton of um, a ton of posts on it, like 5,000, so we can play with it. Um, but a few things I want to kind of go over. Uh, this plugin just does a variety of things. I have a lot of stuff commented out, so I can turn them on and show you what they do. And we can talk about some of those um, methods and steps that we just went through. So the first thing I want to, I want to demo is actually that uh, WP Cron troll plugin. Uh, I mentioned you know that WP Cron is a little bit hard, it can be kind of opaque to see what's going on. Um, but if we look here in our dashboard. <coughs> We go under tools, we have this cron events item. And it'll actually list out all of these scheduled cron tasks. Um, so if we, if we look at my plugin, when, when I activated it, I set up this 
scheduled event to run every hour called the KWD hourly event. And if we look back in our Chrome troll uh, admin, we can see there's my hourly event, and we can see the action that's going to fire, the function that it's going to call, uh, where this lives in the code, so if we need to go find it. And it'll show me when the next run is, which is not for 42 minutes. So it would be kind of unfortunate if we had to wait that long. But let's say we want to test it, and we want to see that it actually fires right now. What's kind of neat is I can just tell it right here, I can click this button and tell it to execute. And so it'll run that function, and it just says successfully execute the prompt. The prompt. Uh, if we go back over and look, this Chrome task was set up to basically just write a couple of things to the error log. And to be able to test if it actually went, we can look at the error log, and I can see there it happened. So I ran it directly. So let's just clear out the error log and we'll do it again. So we've got it here. Since we just ran it, it's already done. But this, we've got 41 minutes still left. But let's just run it directly again and make sure it happens. Here, and there's written into the error log, just occurred. Um, so that's super helpful. You can manually trigger that cron, make sure those tasks are doing what you expect. Um, you can also remove them, um, edit them to like reschedule them to be something else. So if I were to edit this task, I could actually come down and tell it when I want the next run to happen, change the occurrence. Um, so you can modify those two. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is Query Monitor, which is sort of this uh, uber mega plugin that does everything helpful debugging-wise. Um, when you activate it, it puts this little menu at the top. Uh, it gives you a lot of information that you can drop, drop down. If you use uh, the browser dev tools like Chrome Dev Tools or Firefox or Safari, they all have some. This is very similar. Uh, so if I were to, for instance, just jump into this, and click on it, it brings up this menu from the bottom. And it will give me a lot of information about my request, about what just occurred. And as we click around, it will stay open, and it will show me things about that, that happened. How long it took page to generate, how much memory we used, how much database query time actually happened. Uh, we can look at the queries themselves and see every single query that's been run. We can dig into specifically group the queries by what function called them, what method, or even by what component actually triggered the thing. Uh, for instance, let's go back over to my plugin here. And I have this little function that's called bad query, where all I do is I just get every single post on the site in one, in one query. Uh, I made 5,000 post on the site, so it's not something you typically want to run. So let's add that, and I'm going to put it into the admin head. <coughs> and if we were to just refresh now, it might take a minute since it's going to be a bit Okay, so we can tell my plugin actually triggered some queries now, this debugging plugin, and it ran three of them, and they weren't too bad. But you can see, there's the details about the, the query that went in, where it grabbed information about all 5,000 of those posts. Uh, but that's pretty helpful if you, have, uh, if you have a request that's slow, and you want some insight about why it might be slow, this can tell you if you're having some lag between on a bad database query, maybe you need to find a way to optimize that, or to cache it. Uh, this will give you some good insight into that. And if you just go down the list, there's lots of other things. It'll tell you some information about the request, like what kind of query variables, um, which details about the admin screen are true, um, hooks that are firing on this particular screen, every script that's been loaded and its handle, so if you need to use those for something. Uh, same thing with style sheets. Uh, it'll tell you every single action hook that fires and what, what method actually was triggered by it. And this is pretty helpful, especially if you are troubleshooting the order that two actions may be occurring, one's dependent on the thing. Um, this will tell you that order that they fire, because if we're looking at it and we've got a bunch of things that occur in a row, we'll know that you know, this one 
happened before this one and said, oh, we actually needed the order to be switched. Uh, so it gives you some insight into there that you might not otherwise have. It'll tell you sort of all the language calls that are made. Um, if it makes any external HTTP calls, they'll show up here. So if it were to say call out to WordPress.org to check for plugin updates, or if you're using Jetpack or some other plugin that reaches out to a third party server, you'll see all those listed here. Sometimes those are blocking requests and they may slow down the page load. And you'll see that here and you'll see that it's slow. Uh, transients, so there's just there's a lot of, a lot of um, details. This one can be pretty helpful, the conditionals, if you're doing theming. Uh, it can be helpful to know if things like is home is true or is single uh, to make sure that the right page template's loading, the right conditionals are firing. And then environment will just give you a bunch of environment data, like what version of PHP you're running, uh, what version of WordPress, lots of that kind of stuff. So it's really helpful, it gives you a lot of insight. The other thing it does, which is also pretty helpful, is if you have any PHP warnings or errors, it will actually put those into the dropdown for you, whereas otherwise you might have to go look at the log. So I'll, I'll just put a little example here. We have a, a variable that's not defined, um, and obviously since it's not defined, this for each is not going to be very happy. So we'll add this, and we'll see, let's refresh the admin page. It gives you this big bright, bright red Warning, so you know that there's been <coughs> some PHP warnings that have occurred. So if we click into that, it'll tell us each one where it occurred. We can drill in and see the full call stack too, see which that the hook fired and that it triggered. So it's a little bit more useful than just reading the logs. So um, the next thing that's pretty helpful but is a little bit more advanced is uh, xdebug. Um, if you're doing a lot of PHP development, it's pretty helpful though because it's a lot more, uh, it gives you a lot more insight than just a standard output. Uh, so one thing I like, I can give you a quick demo here is um, I have it configured with VS Code. So I can just choose from, I can choose the debugger option, and I choose my listen for xdebug, and I just click start. And I can add breakpoints by clicking this little red dot here. And let's say I just put one here. Now if you notice this bit of code, all I'm doing is calling this function that includes the breakpoint. It doesn't do anything, it just prints some stuff to the screen. But I've added this point. And what's going to happen right now is that when it reaches this, it's going to pause. Um, the code will pause and I'll get some insight into what's occurring. So if I come back over to my window and I just refresh, it actually, you notice it jumped back into the editor. I didn't do that all along. All I did was just refresh the page. So it jumped back into my editor and it gives me a bunch of information about what kind of, what's occurring. You see it's highlighted the line that it paused on, but it also gives me it tells me all the local variables that have been assigned. So you see here I've made a string, and item one, item two. So I can see what each variable is actually set to in that moment. Um, I can also look at other things like globals uh, or constants that are, are set. Um, so you, you get a little bit more details about what, what's occurring there. Well, what else is neat is uh, it shows you the full call stack that's occurred at that point, how you reach that point in the code. And then you can also sort of step over it um, or just continue the request like nothing happened. So if I were just to press continue here, it'll just keep running and um, it will finish the, finish the page load. But you can set a bunch of breakpoints in your code to kind of pause it, see that you make sure that, um, that those variables are set as you expect them to be, and then, or that you're even hitting a breakpoint. Let's say it's inside of a conditional. So if, if we, for instance, if we wrap this in if r equals false, it 
So if we, we wrapped it in this conditional here, that's never going to be true because it's a string. So if we try this right now, this breakpoint should never happen because this code will never execute inside this condition. So if we try it and see, it didn't jump back in the other way. You notice that it didn't, didn't reach back over. It did a full refresh. Uh, now if I were to switch this to, let's say, if or, so if it's set, Now it, now it actually executes. So you can do breakpoints to help you kind of see whether it's reaching a point in your code that should be, if it should be getting there, and then once you're there, what those values might be set to. Um, Xdebug can do a lot of things. It can give you sort of that full stack trace. It can also do profiling. I won't get into all of that right now, but it can give you some kind of performance uh, analysis too. You can do the same thing um, this debugger stuff, you can do the same thing with JavaScript, which is pretty cool. Um, I will add this little sample script here, and all this is is just a little file called test, and I have two little variables set, and then I just do a document write. So all I'm doing is just outputting this to the screen, and we're going to run this. Um, doesn't do anything fancy, but I've added this line in called debugger, and that's a way to manually trigger it. Um, so if I were to go back to my page here and buy with this component. So that. So what happens is if you open up your dev tools on a page, so I'll open them up down here, and I refresh this page, so I have that debugger line in my JS file. If I refresh, you'll see it actually grays out the page. It's paused execution of this at that moment, at that debugger line. And I can do the same things here that I did with Xdebug. I can look over here and I can see these variables that have been set, my greeting and name are both right over here. You can see you know, into, um, into this, you can see all of your global variables that have been set. Um, there's just, there's a lot of information over here. But it allows you to kind of pause, grab the state of everything. Um, similarly, similarly, you can step over it, like I talked about, or just pass through and continue the request. Um, if I scroll over the bottom, there's my little document right hello world that finished. So that's that's pretty helpful. You can also do this um, directly in the browser. So rather than having to do it in your editor, um, you could you can pause them in the browser and you can like pause at that point. Um, you can also set up your IDE to do the same thing we did for Xdebug, where it jumped back into it. Um, so I have one set up here called Launch Chrome. And there's a for VS Code. There's a plugin that handles this, uh, and I can get into that a little bit later. But blog post matters. So if I start this, it'll actually launch a window, and then you'll notice it hit that debugger point, and it kicked me right back over. Uh, but let's take that. Let's just let's stop that for now. Let's take that one. That was not looking right now. Um, what happened? 
happens is you it'll do the same thing where you have um, it'll launch you back into your to your editor. Um, I can do this the same way here. So let's just do it manually. So let's refresh this. I remove that debugger line, but let's say I want to do my breakpoint right here. In Chrome, you can click on the line number. It'll have this little green mark. And if I refresh this now, it'll pause right there on that line. And again, I can see my variables on the side there. So these are like super basic examples. Um, but as you work on more complex code and things like that, you can take these techniques and apply them at a, at a grander scale. Um, 